the moment I feel purposeless and the moment I will one day feel purposeful that there is more purpose in this moment than I thought was possible, but the enemy doesn't want me to see it because he mm. wants me to think I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not who I'm supposed to be. So I dismiss the value of the character God wants to cultivate right now. Don't believe the enemy's lies. God has so much for you where you are because you're loved and chosen right now where you are. Maybe you felt unseen or unworthy, unwanted. I think all of us have felt like that from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, our special guest is Hosanna Wong. She's an international speaker, spoken word artist, best-selling author of How Not to Save the World. <laughs> uh, she grew up in on the streets of San Francisco in urban ministry. And uh, she has a spoken word piece called I Have a New Name. I want to talk to you about that, Hosanna. And her most recent book, You Are More Than You've Been Told, Unlock a Fresh Way to Live Life Through the Rhythms of Jesus, this beautiful book right here. Thanks, mm -hmm. and welcome to the show, Hosanna. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. And you're in San Diego right now, right? I am. Yes. Awesome. Someone had to go, and I said, Lord, <laughs> I feel send like, me. I feel like Hawaii <laughs> and San Diego have the best weather in the nation. That's just mm. my opinion. I just, I'm blessed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're best known for uh, this this spoken word poem, I Have a New Name. Tell us how the poem came to you and the role it's played in the creation of this book. Yeah, well, I grew up uh, doing spoken word poetry on the streets of San Francisco. So I've done spoken word poetry most of my life. Uh, my dad battled a heroin addiction. He fought in a gang and someone introduced him to Jesus and Jesus changed his whole life. And he ended up starting an outreach to those living without homes and battling with addiction on the streets of San Francisco. And that's how I grew up. And people would come to our outdoor services, bringing their alcohol bottles, their needles. And that's how I looked in church. I learned later in life when other people said they were also raised in church. We were not talking about the exact same thing, but that's where I learned that Jesus could save anyone's soul and redeem anyone's story and would use anyone who would say yes. And it's also where I learned the art of spoken word poetry. All my friends on the streets did it. It wasn't unique. Um, and so when my dad passed away, when I was 18 years old, I was trying to find a way to also share about Jesus. And this was the only thing I had, this common way that me and my friends communicated. So spoken word has been a method in which I've expressed myself and also try to share about Jesus with my friends. So seven years ago, I had an identity crisis, mm. um, but I was not in a rock bottom place. I already had chosen Jesus. I already had a thriving ministry. I already had a healthy marriage. I had a community and yet, there were so many lies that had creeped into my life, like the names you mentioned earlier, unworthy, unwanted, unseen. We had a season of immense loss, physically, financially, relationally. The people we thought would stay didn't. The people we thought would defend us didn't. And everything I had based my value on, everything I had built my worth on, my identity on, when it crumbled to the ground, I... I lost who I was and I have a new name came out of this season, a season when I was trying to figure out who I am, fight for my life. And I realized that I had to fight for my life by really fighting for my schedule, um, fighting to really make time to spend time with God really and actually not theoretically, but to actually spend time in his word. And I started memorizing the names that God gave me. Mm -hmm. I started memorizing the words that God said about me, trying to make God's voice the loudest voice in my life. And those names were very different than the other names I was listening to. And as I fought for my life by fighting for my schedule, fighting to spend time with God and started to memorize what he said about me, I started living as, as what he said about me. And I started to get my life back slowly, but surely. And so I wrote this spoken word piece, I Have a New Name, which is truly a declaration of the names God calls us. Um, it's truly just fully plagiarized from the Bible. Like it is all scripture. Hey, I think you can do that. Uh, yeah. You know, the author gave me rights. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Got the permissions. Um, and it's just names that God, I wrote it first for myself. I wrote it first for myself to be something I memorized and quoted to myself over and over just to get 
just to change my posture, my lens and my life. And my husband would say, there's my wife again, like there mm. she is again. Mm. And then I, when I started to perform it, I actually thought it was so personal, but it is all names that God calls all of us. And I realized how many people also just, even if we've already chosen Jesus, or maybe we have never chosen Jesus, that all of us want to know who we are mm -hmm. and what you think about yourself determines how you live. And we want to know how to live the lives we've been created to live. And so there was something just, I think there's something magnetic in our souls. That we gravitate to knowing, to knowing the truth about ourselves. Um, so I think that might be why this piece has resonated with so many people, that truth sets free yeah. and we were all created to live free. Let's say somebody's, you know, driving in traffic today or they're listening to the show and what are a couple of names we could rename ourselves that God says about us? Yeah, if you're here listening and you feel discouraged today and you're struggling with knowing who you are, I would first say you're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been told lies your whole life. And you might think, what are these lies that I'm hearing? Because what you think about yourself determines how you live. So for example, here's some of the wrong names you might be listening to. And then here's some of the right ones, the ones God calls you. You might believe that you're unworthy. And if you believe you're unworthy, you'll start living like you are. You might start trying to do things to prove yourself, to prove your value, work harder, hustle more, to try to prove that you're valuable. If you believe that you're a burden to be loved, you'll start living like you are. Mm. You might try to isolate yourself or not let people into what you're really going through because you believe that if you got real about what you're really going through, you'd be annoying to people. So now you don't want to tell people what your prayer requests are. You don't want to tell people your big dreams because you believe you're a burden to be loved. If you believe you're a failure, you'll start living like you are. You'll believe that anything you try to start or try or want anything you put your hands to will crumble. And so now you don't even want to try anything or risk anything or have big dreams. Sometimes you don't even want to obey God because you believe you're a failure. Mm. And all of these are lies that the enemy of our soul hopes that we believe because he hopes that we answer to lesser names and live lesser lives. And the truth is that you are more than you've been told. And God has some other names for you. And if what you think about yourself determines how you live, then it is so important. It is pivotal that you know who you really are. So you live the life you've been created to live. John 15, 15, he calls you his friend. Amen. First Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls you chosen. Ephesians 2, 10, he calls you his masterpiece. He calls you his art. He calls you handmade. He calls you purpose and fashion for good things. First Corinthians 6, 19, he calls your body a temple. He calls it the residence of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, he calls you his messenger to the world. Galatians 3.26, he calls you his child. Romans 5.8, mm. he calls you greatly loved. John 8.36, he calls you free, mm. free indeed. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he calls you brand new. And it's amazing how mm. different these names are from the names some of us are used to listening to. What you think about yourself determines how you live. So if you want to know how to live the full life you've been created to, we got to know what our creator says about us. No one has the power to define you, but the one who created you. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so good. It, it is. is. Man. 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 Wow. You also, you mentioned being in traffic. Yeah. I need the verse that calls me patience. So I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Lay off the horn a little bit, exactly. Misty. Calm down. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> you made a statement in your book that it just, I guess it really, I don't know. Yeah, you know, sometimes you read something, you're like, man, that phrase is what I've thought but never been able to put into words. Mm -hmm. And you said throughout multiple seasons of my life, there's been a gap between the life I long to live and the life I'm living, knowing who I really am and living like it has been a constant struggle for me. And man, did I relate to that. Um, I have struggled with pretty severe mental health issues since, I mean, they started popping up when I was four. And mm -hmm. I tend to get caught in that loop of, looking back over my life through the lens of what the enemy is telling me and all the ways yeah. that this has impacted what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be, uh, and, and changed that for the worse. So, uh, I wanted you to delve into that statement a little bit because I know, I mean, we're not the only ones that struggle with that. Well, even if it's not mental health related, I think, I think we all go through that. 
Yeah, I agree. I think we all do. And we all do in different ways throughout different seasons in our lives. Maybe we've overcome some lies, but there's some that we haven't been healed from. And maybe our listeners can relate when you feel like there's a gap between who I want to be, who I long to be, who I even believe I could be. Like I see my potential, but it feels like I'm so many steps away from that. And one of the tools that's helped me with this is having a self audit of the voices I'm listening to. Why do I think I'm not enough? Why do I think I'm unworthy? Why do I think that I don't have purpose? Is it something I'm telling myself? Is it something someone said to me years ago, a parent said to me when I was a child or something a coworker said to me five years ago, having a self audit of who are the voices you're listening to? Who are the people whose opinions you put the most stock into? If I were to ask you whose opinion do you care the most about? What comes to mind? Or perhaps what wound comes to mind from your childhood that has given you a broken lens of yourself? Because what you think about yourself determines how you live. So it determines the story you live out. So one of the exercises I've done is having a self audit, writing out all the stories and voices and people that I've allowed to define me and looked at them and thought, what power do these people have to define me? What authority do they have to name me? And then believing these truths, and it's taken quite some time, but reiterating to myself these truths, that no one has the power to define me, but the one who created me, that God's voice must be the loudest voice in my life, and God's lens must be the lens that I see myself through. Because the truth is, no matter what your struggle is, or what was said about you as a kid, or no matter what lies the enemy is having victory in your life right now in, you deserve to stop seeing yourself through the broken lens of other people. When you start to see yourself through the lens of God, you will discover who you really are and who you've always been. And the truth is that you were loved all along and wanted all along, chosen all along. And in this moment, with all that you're going through and all that you have, there's more purpose in this moment than you realize. I've realized there's less of a gap than I thought. Mm. over the moment I feel purposeless and the moment I will one day feel purposeful that there is more purpose in this moment than I thought was possible, but the enemy doesn't want me to see it because he Mm. wants me to think I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not who I'm supposed to be. So I dismiss the value of the character God wants to cultivate right now. Don't believe the enemy's lies. God has so much for you where you are because you're loved and chosen right now where you are. Wow. And we need to be reminded of that constantly, don't we? I feel I find myself hungering and thirsting after that truth daily, really. Yeah, me um, too. So easy to fall into that hole of, I call it fair. Um, you know, <laughs> I seem to be tripping over myself constantly. And so it's easy. But, you know, you alluded to your childhood. I'd love for you to kind of open that chapter for us a little bit. You talk about it in your book. So poignant, the things that God has brought you through that most children would never experience, even involving your little brother. Yeah, I because I grew up in such a unique church environment, um, I saw things I was probably too young to see. The first time we saw someone murdered in front of us, I was nine. My baby brother was three. And so we experienced losses very young. Um, And I think a lot of people can relate, even if we didn't have the same childhood or the same background. Perhaps you two have seen things you weren't supposed to see Mm -hmm. or experienced Mm -hmm. losses, things you're never meant to experience. Perhaps you two had to grow up a little too fast. And I can relate to that. And so growing up for me, because we had such a unique church environment, a unique background, and we experienced things that were different than my, different than what my friends at school were experiencing, (laughs) um, I believed the lie most of my life that I was not enough, that I was too different, that my family was not enough because my dad's past was different than my friend's parents' past, that our church was not enough. It certainly wasn't the same kind of church environment that most of my friends were a part of, that my background was not not enough. I didn't look like the other kids in my class. I was the only Chinese girl in my class, and my family didn't have as much money as other kids at my school. And so I constantly was trying to shape shift myself to fit in what 
I presumed was the mold, look different, look like my friends, dress like my friends, pretend I was wearing the same brands as my friends, Mm -hmm. maybe even watering down the truth about my parents and the truth about our church, embarrassed about who I really was um, at the time. I mean, now I'm so proud to have been raised in the unique church environment I was raised in and so proud to have been raised by a recovered addict because I knew every day of my childhood Jesus was real because I saw what Jesus could do. But at the time, because I did not see people or perhaps there were people like me, but I did not know that there were people like me. I believed the lie that I was not enough and I had to change myself to be accepted. But that lie really did continue with me into my adult life, even as I was ministering in prisons and recovery ministries and churches and conferences, writing books, performing spoken word poetry. I also believed the lie that I had to change a little bit about who I was to be effective In fact, early on in my spoken word ministry, which is how I started before I started writing books or preaching, um, leaders who now I believe uh, really loved me and wanted to support me. Like now I see it through a different lens, but I think they were a little bit misinformed. Early on in my spoken word ministry, they said, we think your background's going to stand in the way of you being effective in the church. Hmm. So you probably shouldn't share the whole story. And really? you probably shouldn't go by the last name Wong. Oh, I think brother. that I think that'll be My a goodness. wall between you being effective where you feel called. And I believed them and I agreed with them. Mm. I thought that mm. sounds smart. I also have never seen someone that looks like me with my background speak anywhere. I've never seen anyone with the last name Wong. I know now there was plenty people with my similar background, but because I had not seen it, I was fighting an uphill battle I did not have to fight. Had I known, had I seen it. Also, I don't know this. They've never said this to me. But now, years later, the way I see it is I think they really did love me and want to support me. And I think they might have believed this lie about themselves. They didn't oh, say it in a mean way. And, and they didn't, they've never said that to me. But now I see. So did I this come from someone thought, that was Asian that said this? No, no, no. These oh. were not Asian. These were not Asians. These okay. were these were not Asian. Um, these and And they were. Uh, had been in ministry much longer, much older. They had wisdom. They had reasons for me to trust them. But now I see that perhaps you also (laughs) maybe believe this lie about yourself that you had to preach like other people. Oh, gotcha. Or or lead like other leaders or sound like other people. And they're putting it off on you. And perhaps projecting, because I don't think it was meant maliciously. I I really have thought a lot about this. And I know that they also want to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I think they were truly thinking, how can she be best um, postured to do what we think God has also mm-hmm. called her to do. We probably need to water down the things that make her stick out too much. I, mm. I, I actually really think that. And so I believe them. I think that might've been a lie that was passed down to them and then passed down to me that we're all trying to be leaders that look like other leaders or speakers that sound like other speakers and maybe thinking that our details are too much for the church. And that is such a lie from the enemy. We don't see that backed up in scripture at all. And so it's been a journey for me to to realize the truth. You know, when I started sharing the truth about where I was from and my real sins, yeah. And the things God really redeemed me from. My real questions, my dad's real background. Um, when I started sharing the truth about that, and I saw how people responded, not because they had the exact same background as me, but because they also felt like a little different. Mm-hmm. I was just so convicted. Um, I had I had to really repent. God, I'm sorry that I have watered down a story you gave me. I'm sorry that I've tried to pretend that I'm anyone else than I am. I'm sorry that I've helped perpetuate the lie Mm. that we Mm. have to change who we are in order to be loved, accepted, and effective to bring the gospel forth. And so had you known my spoken word ministry 15 years ago, you wouldn't have known me by Hosanna Wong. I went by a pen name for years, Hosanna Poetry. It was one of many ways I was watering down the details of who I was, hoping to be used by God more. And now I know the truth that the enemy doesn't want us to know, but it is actually your background and where you're from and what you've overcome and your lens of the world and your questions. It is actually your details that God wants to use in this exact moment in time. Of course, the enemy of our souls wants us to try to look at other people and compare ourselves to other people and try to be other people. 
He cannot risk all of us discovering who we really are. Because if we all start to talk about Jesus through our real experiences and the variety of our different lenses, then more people would hear about Jesus through different lenses. More Mm. people would hear about God in their language. More people would know Jesus Christ. And so it has been a journey of me repenting of the ways I've been a part of a culture and perpetuated a lie that said we need to look like each other or sound like each other and me trying to do my best to speak the truth about where I've really been. And when other people see the truth about where God has redeemed you from, they see that God can also redeem them in their real messy lives too. Um, yeah. So I mean, I've been going by Hosanna Wong for a few years now and <laughs> also uh, re-released I Have a New Name this past year under Hosanna Wong. We re-recorded it, reimagined it for a younger generation that loves to stream things in a mm-hmm. different way. And so yeah. we really re-released it, but I said, we have to go under Hosanna Wong. It is so important that the next generation um, learns the truth I wish I would have learned a little earlier. I love that. It's almost like um, someone saying to Paul, now don't talk about how you persecuted Christians and, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe don't <laughs> yeah. start with that. Yeah, no, I, right. I get it though. I get yeah. it. You almost, you almost see their lens though. Sure. Like why they were like, maybe don't start with this or like, right. maybe you shouldn't do this. And then I think about all the other people who hated Christians yeah. that needed to hear that someone who once hated Jesus and yep. once hated the disciples and once hated Christians changed their mind. Like, I actually think Paul might not have been for everybody, but sure. good news, there was Peter. Good yep. news, there was other people. <laughs> exactly. Good news, yes. there was other lenses. Um, and I think that's important that all of us share from our lens. Paul and Love Peter. That. You know what I mean? You know, and they disagreed on a bunch of stuff too. So good right. thing they both shared the gospel. Like, yeah. praise the Lord. That's yeah. right. I love the yeah. respect that you showed your dad. I lost my sister too alcoholism and drug abuse Mm. and somebody who was very, very close to me at the end of her uh, service said to me, I don't think you should be ashamed of your sister. And I was like, it was like such an eye opening to how much people think they have to cover up. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know they thought they were being kind to me, but I was like, far from, I just heard my say, far from it. I'm so proud mm-hmm. of her and the fight that she put up. And now she rests in the arms of Jesus. And, you know, that's the end of the story that really matters. It's and probably a thought you never had before. Testimony. Why would I be ashamed? Absolutely. You're right, Mike. Yeah. Uh, Kank, you're right. It's just, it was such a shock. And I was glad that it was such a shock. So thank you for yeah. recognizing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm. You you talk about the rhythms of Scripture and Jesus. And by the way, that sounds beautiful. So mm. when you when you consider Jesus's life on Earth, yeah. what are some practices or habits you see that we can emulate or or we should be practicing? Yeah. Well, Jesus heard quite a bit of lies too mm-hmm. in his life, mm. and he also had people who. Um, praised him and then changed their minds about him, people who believed he was a son of God and people who believed he didn't. So one of the things I did was a deep dive study on the life of Jesus, thinking, okay, I want to know who I am and how to live. How did Jesus do it? If I'm going to copy anyone's lifestyle these days, I'm going to take it from the man himself. Yep, that's a good one. (laughs) Jesus, yeah, I was like, you know, I have an idea. (laughs) And uh, Jesus was fully God. So it's easy to say, well, Jesus probably knew how to do all of this automatically. He probably had some kind of divine Dropbox download directly (laughs) into his life. It's unfair to say, how did Jesus do this? But the word of God says that Jesus was not just fully God. He was also fully man. And he Mm -hmm. came as a baby like all of us. And he had to learn who he was. He had to grow up and learn how to talk, how to have relationships, how to have boundaries, how to forgive. God thought it was important that we also had not just a God, but a human have the same same temptations as us, the same kind of loss as us and show us how we too can overcome the lies of the enemy. And I was fascinated by the scripture in Matthew where Jesus is tempted by the enemy three times, right? He's in a desert 40 days. The enemy comes at him three times, tempting him and lying to him, trying to convince him he's something he's not. He says, if you are the son of man, if you are the son of God, and then he tries to tempt him to do something to prove who he is. And Jesus came back at him each time with truth. And I thought, what did Jesus do before this moment that prepared him for this moment? Mm -hmm. How did Jesus know who he was? So 
you asked what rhythms I, I can point to, and I can point to four that Jesus lived throughout his life that we have evidence of, stories of in the New Testament, stories that prepared Jesus for that moment, before that moment. And there's four. One is a rhythm of scripture. <clears throat> Jesus didn't just quote scripture because he was born knowing all of it. There's actually stories before this moment of Jesus going out of his way to go into the temple, to go where the scrolls were, where what was written of the Bible at the time was Jesus on a road trip with his family. He leaves the path everyone else is on to be in a temple. And the Bible says to be in the scrolls, to be around religious leaders, ask them questions and listen to their answers. We see a rhythm of Jesus going out of his way to know what God says about him and also be around other people who wanted to know what God says about us. Jesus knew scripture in that moment when there was lies, because before that moment, he had a rhythm of going out of his way to know God's word. The second rhythm is a rhythm of prayer. We see that Jesus goes out of his way in times when people were trying to pull him to go to this city or go to that city. They had ideas of what they thought Jesus should do. And I think a lot of us can relate when we have a lot of responsibilities, family responsibilities, relationship responsibilities, church responsibilities, mission responsibilities, good things. Jesus also had a pretty important calling. And yet he goes out of his way to make sure that he's not going anywhere that anyone else is pressuring him to, but he's directed by God. He goes out of his way and prays to God. And then the next day he says, I'm going over here now. And people didn't agree, but Jesus knew where he was called to go to next because he first fought to spend real time with God. Jesus shows an example of fighting for his schedule. We see Jesus, a third rhythm is a rhythm of rest. Again, a lot of people wanted to overwhelm Jesus, overwhelm his time, but Jesus demonstrated a lifestyle of rest. God commanded rest and then Jesus exemplified rest. He actually exemplified Sabbath, a day of rest. He also said not to worship it. Um, You know, don't don't worship the spiritual discipline. But he did show us planning for it, Mm -hmm. that he had a rhythm of how he could fulfill his calling and also rest, knowing Mm -hmm. he was already loved without doing one thing. And some of us, God knew that we would believe this lie that we have to do more, produce more, do what everyone says we have to do, carry more, carry more for other people in order to obey God and fulfill our calling. But Jesus shows us that he was able to rest and also live the life he was created to live. Um, This is a rhythm Jesus would have had before that moment in the desert. There's actually a translation that says, um, even though Jesus had not eaten for 40 days, he was curiously stronger. I think some of us, we've heard this scripture and read it and thought he was weak. The enemy came when Jesus was weak, but actually Jesus was able to overcome these lies. Even though he didn't have physical nourishment, he had spiritual nourishment. He was curiously stronger because he had already lived a life of knowing who he was in scripture, being in prayer, knowing what God said about him and resting. He was already, he was curiously stronger, even in this moment where we think he should have been weak. And the fourth rhythm is a rhythm of real community. Jesus had a rhythm of constantly being in community. He had large community, then a smaller community, then smaller. And I don't mean real community in the way some of us dream of it. Like, oh, my home girl for 40 years, my ride or die, who lives on my same block. We have the same amount of kids and we can share the same genes. Like, I know that's the dream, but that's nobody's real life. And so I yeah. mean real community in the way that Jesus talked about real community, getting real with people about what you're really going through so that they can also get real with you about what they're going through and God can be glorified in our real lives. And I would break that down into two practical ways confession and celebration, getting real with people about what you're really going through and celebrating what God is already doing and has already done. These are actually commandments of God. These are things God commands us to do and Jesus exemplified, but sometimes we don't see celebration as a commandment from God or a rhythm of Jesus. And maybe that's why we're so exhausted and weighed down. We've picked the spiritual mm-hmm. disciplines. We think, oh, I got to read the Bible more and go to church more. But we don't realize that God's also called us to be around people and to confess and to celebrate. And celebration gives life to all the other spiritual disciplines. So all of these things were things that Jesus did before this moment had a rhythm of scripture, a rhythm of prayer, a rhythm of rest, a rhythm of real community. Mm. And then when lies came into his life, when temptation was at 
his doorstep, Jesus was able to know who he was and overcome Mm -hmm. lies and temptation. And we can too. Recently, my husband and I, we just celebrated our nine year anniversary. Congratulations. We went, oh my gosh. Thanks. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. It has truly been the best nine years of his life. He is so blessed. <laughs> and <laughs> he made me spit out my coffee. <laughs> um, so, anyways, tr- truly, we were both blessed. And so, we've been married for nine years. We met at a church. Um, he was a pastor at a church in Las Vegas while I was touring. I toured for four and a half years doing spoken word all over the country. And I was, I came to this church in Las Vegas. So it's our nine year anniversary. I recently preached on a Sunday at that church in Las Vegas and my husband like wanted to make a whole date out of it. So we went to Cirque du Soleil. Are you familiar with this? Cirque yeah. du Soleil? Mm-hmm. If, uh-huh. it's the weird like a, contortioning of the, yeah. they do some amazing stuff with their bodies. The scary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put it. Weird contortioning of the bodies. It is it's like an acrobatic athletic experience. Yes. People are flying from, from one like boat in the air to another boat in the air and they're wearing like glitter and feathers. Like it's truly an experience. So he took me there and after, after the show, I've never seen anything like it. After the show, perhaps it was pure bliss or it was pure ignorance. But I looked at my husband and I said, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you think I could do that? And he, cause he wants a happy life. He wants a happy wife. And so he said, yes, yes, <laughs> I think you could do that. <laughs> and then I looked back at, I looked back at the room. We were just, and I said, do you think I could do that right now? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, why don't you think I could do that right now? And he said, you would have to practice. You would have to train. The only reason why you were able to see them do that in that moment is because of the lifestyle they have before this moment. Mm -hmm. They're not Uh. able to do that because they just tried really hard in a moment. They have a whole lifestyle preparing them for that moment. And I, I think that is a good example of what it looks like to follow Jesus and to know who you are and how to live. Jesus does not expect us to give our lives to him and then all of a sudden in a moment be able to live as he would live. All of a sudden mm. be able to overcome every lie and every temptation. No, Jesus said, come and follow me and follow my lifestyle and I'm going to show you how to live, a fresh way to live. I'm going to show you how to have relationships, how to have boundaries, how to rest. And your lifestyle before the hard moments is going to prepare you for those moments. And so that's really where I have found um, that these four rhythms Mm. are critical into following Jesus and into living the life you've been created to live. Fight for your life by fighting for your schedule. Look Mm. at your calendar and say, how am I going to fight to go out of my way to spend time to engage in God's word? fight to go out of my way to find time in solitude, silence, and prayer. I'm going to fight to go out of my way to rest and fight to go out of my way to have community. This will help us actually follow Jesus and know who we are and live the lives we've been created you to You do live. have to fight for your schedule, don't you? really you? do. You oh, my do. God. It's a fight. Yeah. Everything Absolutely. Against, everything in our worlds and yeah. everything in your specific world is fighting against you having time alone with God, but you will know who you really are when you spend real time with the one who knows you best. Yep. Make fighting for time with God the most important fight of your life. And isn't it encouraging to know that Jesus was fully human? I think we, you know, the Bible says that he stripped himself of all of his godly power. Yeah. So he grew up, well, the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature. stature. It's kind of like, wait a second, God grew yeah, that mm-hmm. might be confusing to some people, but he didn't automatically know everything. He studied, you know. Yeah, he he yeah. was in the Word, absolutely. Yeah, mm. that's beautiful. Good. You were talking earlier about the names that the enemy gives us, that the world gives us, and often that we tend to give ourselves based on those things, and how opposite it is of what God and who God says we are. And not mm. only, obviously, does that color our perception of ourselves, but um, it could be a real dangerous distraction from what God has called us to do. Talk about that a little bit. Mm. Say more. What do you mean? Like how? Just when you, I think when you're bogged down in the lies that you've been fed about yourself, how it can prevent you from even being able to see the road that God is calling you down sometimes Yeah, because you've, you've bought into this lie about yourself and you don't think maybe you're you're capable. Yeah. 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 I agree. I think that 
when we believe lies about ourselves that can act as a ceiling over our lives, stopping us from living the lives God's called us to live. So like if you, I, I know so many people and I have been this too. If I think I'm unworthy or if I'm not enough, then anytime I want to write something or say something or start something or create something, I might overthink so much and talk myself out of obeying God because I'm thinking, how can I make this enough for this person? And how can I make this worthy for this person? And actually, what if these people say this? If you believe these lies about yourself, then you're constantly living to prove yourself to other people. And so I think that's one way you, you overthink yourself out of obeying God. And then if you knew that God called you and chose you and handmade you for this moment, now I can think, I'm going to create what God's called me to create. I'm going to say what God's called me to say. And yes, a lot of people might not agree with this, but I am called in this moment. It helps you. It helps you when you make God's voice the loudest voice in your life, not overthink or talk yourself out of obeying him. Um, is that what you're asking? Like how, how can lies literally stop you from obeying God? Yeah. yeah. I think that's one example. I don't know if any of you can think of examples too, of how that might manifest in your life or lives of people with that you do life with. Mm. But that's one that I can think of specifically when you don't know who you are and you find your identity in other people. Sometimes you're not saying, making, creating, or doing what God's called you to do. Instead, you're doing what you think is expected of you. Yeah. And I think that's one way I think the enemies had victory in my life multiple times. Mm. We, we've talked about it often. One of the lies that I buy into um, is sharing my mental health struggles. And before, anytime I'm about to mm. talk about it, I hear that voice. Don't you think people are tired of hearing about sick Misty? Come on. They don't want to hear about that again. Mm. When <laughs> and the ultimate end goal, obviously, in that lie is to not share what God has done in my mm. life in those dark times. So, yeah. I mean, just like live process what you're saying as someone who's not an expert, but is a student. I don't feel like I've heard a lot of people talk about it in a Jesus following space. So even as you said it to you, it's your story. And you're saying, oh, I don't, you know, am I saying this too much? Or are people getting tired of this? I'm hearing it for the first time and thinking, I actually do hear about this a lot um, in the context of what the world thinks about it. I actually hear about it a lot on social media from people who don't follow Christ. But I don't think I hear about it often about people bringing it through the lens of God or how you have lived your life being fully who you are and also following Jesus and the tension you feel and the questions you have and what answers of God that you have. And so for me, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. You have a different story than me. I'm going to learn something from you. You're going to teach me something about God. I just think that's an example for all of our listeners to live here right now. Here's a, a lie that sometimes you've heard. And then here's me saying, oh, no, please don't listen to that lie, because mm -hmm. I want to hear about this through the context of what God is saying to you. Mm -hmm. um, and how can I better speak to people who have the same kind of background as you? Would you teach me? Tell me what your life is really like and what your struggles have been. Can you teach me? And I think that might be the same for all of us with the lies that we've heard. Some of the most fearless, like when I wrote I Have a New Name and when I wrote The Red Book, You Are More Than You've Been Told, there's stories in there that I was so afraid to share. Um, and I think God let me have healing in those areas before I shared them. But once I shared them, those stories are the ones I'm getting the most feedback on. I've never heard someone share something like this mm. about their childhood. I've never heard someone explain in detail about an awkward situation as a kid that actually gave them a, the wrong lens of their life or forever. And so I waited until I had some healing. So I had authority to speak on it. But I am glad that I was brave enough to say it, even knowing I'm obeying God, even if no one likes this. Um, <laughs> like you know that. what I mean? Like, that's all the time. That's me. Like, right, Lord, did you call me to do this? I'm going to do it even if no one likes it. But I, I see that. I see how sometimes it is the things the enemy's lying to us the most about that when we overcome those lies, that's where like a very unique victory is taking place through us. So thank you for sharing your story and, and convicting me in that today. I receive Aww. I receive that. Thank you for the encouragement. That's well, awesome. I've heard it said we're more alike in our weaknesses than our strengths. So mm. I think getting it out there yeah. helps someone else in that area. Like mm. you just said, Hosanna, it's, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And part of that I love on the copy of your newest book is a picture of a vine and yeah. um, wrapped around a pole. 
it's this idea of the trellis that really drew me to you, Hosanna, that I was mm. just like, I need her to tell this concept really based on John 15. Take it away. It's so strong. Oh my goodness. Thank you, my friend. Um, when I was in that season after writing, I have a new name where I had lost who I was. I was trying to figure out how do I get back to knowing who I am? How do I practically discover who I am and live like it? And I knew in church growing up, they would say, find your identity in Christ. And I thought, okay, I love that. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. And they would say, if you want to find your identity in Christ, you have to abide in Christ. And I'm in, you don't have to sell me, I'll abide. But can someone practically show me how, what does it look like to abide in, in my real life today? So I actually called my friend who works in vineyards and we get this verse, we get this term abide from Jesus himself. Like you mentioned in John 15, Jesus says, abide in me, I will abide in you. With me, you will bear great fruit. Without me, you will accomplish nothing. And so I called my friend who works in vineyards, but she has no context of this scripture. She was not raised in church. So I knew she would give me her agricultural answer, not the churchy answer. And I said, is there anything else you can tell me about branches being connected to vines? Or all branches need to live is to be connected to the vine. And she said to me this, and it changed my whole life. And she said, technically, yes, all branches need to live is to be connected to the vine. But they you really need a trellis. They need a structure to help them have even sunlight. They're not too hot. They're not too cold. They don't rot. And they're able to stay connected to the vine and flourish. And I said, okay, what if I don't care about flourishing? <laughs> like, what if I just want to survive? Doesn't all branches need to live is to be connected to the vine? And she said, yes, all branches need to live is to be connected to the vine, but without a structure without a trellis, they will live their lives constantly weighed down and mm. they will fight an uphill battle. They don't have to fight. And like, does anyone else feel weighed down today? I, I heard that and I thought that is the answer. I'm not disconnected from Jesus. I did choose Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus, but I feel so weighed down carrying weights I'm not meant to carry. And she said, eventually, if branches don't have a structure, they will grow apart from themselves and then they'll grow apart from the vine. It's actually essential that you have a structure. And that's when I realized that to reclaim my life, I needed to reclaim my structure, to look at my habits that I was having. I was trying to have habits that I had 10 years ago or wait to have certain habits I knew God had called me to have maybe like in a year when I had the perfect job and the perfect schedule and everything was more ideal. And I realized that I needed to reclaim my life today to reclaim my structure and spiritual disciplines are habits that God commanded, but Jesus exemplified, like we talked about rhythms of rest and prayer and scripture and real community and many others. And I realized I needed to reclaim my structure so I didn't live so weighed down so that I could be connected and stay connected to Jesus. It turns out the answer was a structure, but there's two things that really transform my life from that moment that I'd love to share with listeners today, because maybe it can transform you too. One is that many of us were raised in um, Christ following communities that perhaps were well-meaning, but maybe put too much, maybe all the emphasis on the structure. You have to read the Bible this much, mm. go to church this much in order to be saved. And it came with some legalism and some shame and some guilt if we missed a day or we missed a week. But Jesus came and set us <laughs> free from guilt and shame. So that's not it. And so what I had to realize in my life, what changed my life was realizing there is no life in this structure. There is no salvation in this structure. A trellis, it's just a stick. All agricultural experts would say it's a stick. There is no vitamins, water, life source in the stick. Its best function is to help you be connected to the source. So there is no salvation in the structure. There's only salvation in the source, Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. But a structure will help you stay connected to Jesus. And I realized I needed a better structure. Sure. The whole point is to have a real one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus, but I was not taking my schedule seriously or my habits seriously. I was living on autopilot, living at the pace of whatever was happening around me. To reclaim your life, you might need to reclaim your structure. The other thing I want to say to people is that maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus before, and today you're choosing to follow him and you're saying, okay, I'm going to start a structure. I'm going to start 
looking at my calendar and saying, I'm going to start reading the word of God, start praying, start resting and start being in real community. And you're going to start with a structure. But, and that's good. Praise God. Start with the structure. Your relationship with Jesus does not have to look like anyone else's relationship with Jesus. It just has to be real and ongoing. A real one-on-one relationship is what Jesus wants to have with you. So you start, you practice, you start following Jesus. But some of us have followed Jesus for a long time. And we might feel like our routines have grown stale. Mm -hmm. And we don't feel like we're getting any life out of the word of God. God, or it just has become mundane or routine. So many of our rhythms, we followed Jesus for a long time and we're thinking, is there something wrong with my faith? Like, is there mm. something wrong with me and my relationship with God? Like, what is it? And maybe it is a sin that you need to repent of and surrender to the feet of Jesus. But I think for many of us, it's not a sin. For many of us, it's not that there's something wrong with our faith. It might be that there has been new growth that there are new responsibilities in your life that you did not have 15 years ago. It might be that you're flourishing and you're bearing new fruit and you're carrying new weights. The same structure that supported you 15 years ago will not support you today. And Mm -hmm. for some of us, we need a stronger structure, a wider structure. When you start a vineyard, the, the trellis The trellis structure is very thin, but as it grows and it has more fruit and more branches and it's producing more and flourishing more, the structure grows wider. It grows stronger. So for those of us who have followed Jesus for a long time, we need to relook at our structure and have perhaps a fresh way to engage with God's word, a fresh way to pray, a fresh way to rest, a fresh way to have real community so that we can grow and flourish and do all God has called us to do. But some of us know God is calling us to do more, carry more, and has given us new dreams, but we are not taking our structure seriously Mm -hmm. to be able to carry the weight of what God is calling us to do now. Wow. So 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 my encouragement is to reclaim your structure. You know, uh, and a lot of that has to do with our schedule. I I think (laughs) in this day, wow. Everything is so go, go, go. How have you done that? And how come? Perfectly. (laughs) (laughs) I am the model. You're nailing it. Yeah. (laughs) My husband will tell you, man, she is killing it. Um, (laughs) You know, we don't do it perfectly, um, but we do do it intentionally. We have decided that we're not going to just live on autopilot to how we lived three years ago or how someone else lives. So we don't do it perfectly. Um, But my husband and I, at the beginning of every month, we go on a date and we look at our month calendar and we look at it and, and not all of our months are created equal. I think this is why I really lost sight of my structure. I kept trying to have like this perfect symmetrical structure every week and try to do it the way I saw my mom do it or my pastor do it or the way I did it 10 years ago. But not all months are created equal Mm. for us these days. And my husband and I don't have the same job. So we don't have the same schedule. And, you know, our family doesn't go through crises when we would prefer them to. (laughs) And losses cannot be planned for. Can we schedule those? (laughs) Hey, if you could actually move this date. um, Yeah. There's so much going on. And the the more you're, and I think some of this is good, the more that you have like an empathetic heart and your heart is for other people and your heart is heavy for other people, now there's more people that you feel you want to be there for and you're called to, I think that is actually all a good thing. So how can we have a structure to do all God's called us to do best? My husband and I look at our month and we say, okay, I'm traveling this week. So the Sabbath that we're having, the day off, the 24 hours that we are putting aside to not work, but to stop and rest and delight in what we already have and who God is. This week, it can't be a Friday because I'm traveling on a Friday. So this week is actually Thursday. And then the next week, we actually have a big church event that's on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, And so our Sabbath that day is Monday. Okay, the next week. So we look at our week and we have a structure for that month. And it doesn't look the same that it did last month or the next month. Same for me. In the ways that I engage with God's word, it's different than how I engage with God's word three years ago. And the times that I pray and fight for silence and solitude, it might not be. If I have a flight at four. You know, if I'm leaving for a flight at 4 a.m., I might not wake up at 3 a.m. to be in silence and solitude. Gee, why it might not? be, you know, because John Tintan, abundant life. Um, it might be now when I land and in the evening, I'm having tea at a fire at a hotel 
and I'm having a long time with God then. And I'm not doing it perfectly. And I'm also, when I don't do it, I don't carry guilt or shame with me because mm. Jesus came and set me free from all of that. Yeah. The next day I look at my schedule and try to fight to spend time then too. So I will say we don't do it perfectly, but we do do it prayerfully. And one of the things that God called us, we felt a couple years ago, we felt God called us to do more. And we thought, God, that can't possibly be true. <laughs> like we don't have the margin to do right. more, to carry more, to be involved with more ministries or more communities, uh, me more involved in certain family members' lives. Like there's no way you're going to have to grow our capacity. I don't have the emotional capacity, the social capacity. You're going to have to grow our capacity. So we prayed for weeks. Would you grow our capacity so that we can obey you? Not just God, we can't obey you, but God, will you grow it? And over a week's time, we felt like God really brought to mind margin that we had, but we were saying yes to things we weren't supposed to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And we were filling it with things we didn't need to fill it with. And God brought to mind ways we had margin for rest and margin for the, these moments. And so we come to our, our lives, you know, yearly, what is God calling us to do this year and how can we plan our lives and also monthly. Um, it's not perfect, but my husband and I have had kind of a line in the sand moment, maybe two years ago when we started taking these rhythms and reclaiming our structure together and separately, um, seriously. And it really has just changed our marriage and our ministry. We are caring more than we did two years ago, but we, on our best days, not all the time, but on our best days, we don't feel weighed down. And that's my hope for everyone listening to. Your life might not look like mine and my husband's, and that's a good thing. Uh, have a structure for your life that Amen. will evolve month to month in the name of Jesus. That's good. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, uh, thank you so much. I think our time is done. Wow, that was nice. I know. Good Conversation going. is oh, wow. so good. I know. Yeah, you guys are is... awesome. I love these questions and, and this conversation. I oh, hope this wow. helps people. Wow. Well, I think this yeah. is going to help us in a lot of ways. Structure yeah. is one thing uh, I think that a lot of us are missing. And, um, you know, you're right. <laughs> you get to points in your relationship with God. It's like, I realize what I'm doing is rote here as opposed to a spirit-led activity Mm -hmm. I'm just doing this because I've always done it this way and you're not getting the same out of it. Well, yeah. hello, um, really should be spirit led and guided by him anyway. You are more than you've been told. Unlock a fresh way to live through the rhythms of Jesus. Hosanna, thank you so much for mm. spending time with us. It's been really thank good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's Thanks. good stuff.